Man, I thought, thought it'd be nice to start in Soho. I mean, technically speaking, Soho's over there, down there, literally. Bear with me, guys. I will get through everything. Hopefully, I get through. What is the title of this video? What is the what is the Soho effect? What's the lofts around Manhattan? How have they been exported? What is the Soho loft, essentially? And uh, if I am sniffling, it's because it is cold out here. I will try my best through all the noise and through everything else, basically. Hopefully. Oh, so I hope you're enjoying this video, Professor. Uh, hopefully I'm not breaking the fourth wall. I hope everybody just enjoys this video. Mm -hmm. You can see it right there, these lofts are, you know, I mean, you can tell from just looking right into them right there. High ceilings, Sony's have been renovated, I mean, you can just, I mean, you can just tell. This one right here is even a better example, look at that. These are big rooms. Can you imagine if I actually, like, lived in the loft? How much more personal would this have been? for the video. I think it is important to note though that lofts didn't originate, you know, specifically in Manhattan. The conversion of space uh, from it could be either like schools, buildings, whatever, you may call it that, were eventually abandoned, actually originated in France in the 19th century. Um, it wasn't until the 20th century that, you know, the whole conversion in which artists started to move in because manufacturing went south that you have this space, this new space usually of warehouses that become really cheap because they're well their businesses have gone they're basically gone I imagine though like you know this is a pretty good deal you're like you'd be an artist i mean some of these places are like 3,600 square feet and you know paying low rent you can really much you know do anything it's a huge deal consider this it was a really good book actually by soho resident jim stratton 1977 uh, pioneering the urban wilderness basically covers like more than like a dozen cities um, that you have these loft developments. So again, not particularly unique to New York City. However, you do have it where uh, artists took over spaces ranging from supermarkets to storefronts, to schools. Like I said, New York City, however, was the most photogenic and it was the most publicized. And so when you have an area that's the most publicized, obviously there's a certain imaginary that occurs from anybody around the nation, including the world that sees this news. I think it's cool to situate that it was especially popular in terms of aesthetic because it had the cobblestone, you know, many of these places had like the cobblestone brownstone, right? Um, sort of architecture to them. And it was just an area that, you know, was really cool to many people. You literally have this coverage up by a lot of art and culture to New York City, artists creating works and virtually revitalizing certain parts of the city that were deemed as doomed, by the way, you know, eventually becoming an area that is trendy. And you all, you all of a sudden have people, because of this art and, you know, um, culture sort of coming back with because of artists and because of different people, you know, seeing the places like, oh yeah, that's like the place to be. You have the return of the middle class. I'm back, baby! Once the middle class sort of returned to these areas, remember that the city at this point in the 1970s was like decrepit with industry going right south. And I will, while I really nail that point home with that, you basically have a middle class coming back. So you have more wealth coming back into the city around this time. And then you have private investors in the housing market sort of literally reinventing what it means to have a housing market in that sense. And you basically have uh, first, they don't really get that many loans from the bank. I mean, the New York City at the time doesn't really believe that these places can be that great. They do believe that there is potential for reinvestment and then sort of prices going up in terms of the properties and sort of, you know, bringing money back. They're not really too sold until the mid 1970s when reinvest um, real estate developers really do actually take advantage of it and they start to refurnish and then banks finally lend them out the loans for this redevelopment that they need in these houses to make it look well cleaner more trending more poppy and so in the end lofts basically helped the image of new york city come from this gritty abandoned sort of place where yeah you know there's a lot of financial stuff and you have a lot of tall buildings, skyscrapers, 
but it basically allowed it to become a place that was like habitable and it wasn't just known at the time for maybe it's high crime rates or uh, drug abuse so i mean you have to think about this in the sense that you know it did not cost city a lot of tax revenue or the federal government to like construction funds for these lofts or the return of the right you know the middle class of the urban center i mean it sort of just occurred there was no other policy put in place at this time of course just like anything ever it doesn't last forever we have these two different sort of things occurring in the entire atmosphere in which this occurs allows for one the state's benign acceptance of residential conversion indicated the final step in a long-term strategy of urban deindustrialization and the expansion of lawful living in the peripheral social culture sort of allowed for you know artists coming in and you know as well as a state intervention at the end in the housing market a housing market that initially like wasn't there but it was created and this of course as many urban planners and sociologists and anthropologists might consider is that results yes in gentrification and there's a little video after this that would do a much greater job at giving a definition than i will gentrification is a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change in a historically disinvested neighborhood by means of real estate investment and new higher income residents moving in as well as demographic change not only in terms of income level, but also in terms of changes in the education level or racial makeup of residents. I will get to the Soho effect in just a minute. Just, just, just give me a little bit more time. And that is why there is this shift basically happening where the prices were really low and all of a sudden it becomes super high even for the artists to, you know, sort of bear. So they are run out essentially. I mean, you have, you know, the main victims of this gentrification through loft living are these business owners who are essentially lower middle class and their workforce and right, it resulted in the demand and prompted landlords to increase supply as if they were operating in the conventional housing market so in that sense you know many people of course they look back and they're like oh yeah well duh it's kind of like yeah you know they refurnish these styles right they gained these banking loans finally by the mid-1970s but it wasn't always like that and i think that just resulted a lot more in them using these spaces that were not i mean there weren't conventional houses obviously but it just it just sort of turned into something like that where it's like oh yeah we're gonna treat this exactly like how it is in the housing market for anything else that we usually like get you're goddamn right and with more middle class individuals who weren't artists you know just coming into because uh it was trendy and coming into right like how i was about to say Take advantage of the whole scene that, you know, there's culture here. There's a lot of, you know, life here. Like, just imagine this. You live somewhere as festive as this area. This entire area, possibly. Not that this is, I guess, well, this could be around, like, so. This is a little Italy, but, like, you know, you just have this entire community to yourself. And then the prices get jacked up and you can no longer stay. And you lose an entire community. Your whole social connections get ruined. You're uprooted. And because somebody somewhere said that, you know, it was a good idea, it was gonna revitalize the city, but it actually didn't. So that was a fucking lie. And this finally, this finally comes all to collection of the Soho effect. Clear. The Soho effect is a term where artists who make a neighborhood hip and trendy must move out because they can no longer afford to live in the area they help make desirable. The Soho effect is a term created to explain gentrification of an area where due to popularity is then taken by the privatized housing market of a city, basically fixed up, and only people of higher incomes are eventually able to sort of move in. And it does then sort of create almost this little enclave, this little niche of, oh yeah, only these certain types of people, unfortunately, can now live here. And it changes the entire, I mean, the, the entire image of the neighborhood, right? I mean, you can have a certain different, you can grow up in that neighborhood with different demographic groups and all of a sudden it's flushed out. By the way, around 1975, when all of this stuff was happening, 
gradually, not overnight, obviously, but very gradually and very quickly within that decade, you there is still this, uh, I would like to call it time interval or range in which New York City was really reimagining its new construction. And there were different private companies like the REBNY that were sort of pushing forth for this new revitalization of the city in a sense i say that very you know very carefully because it's like oh to revitalize the city you know make it more modern and make more modern looking new buildings but the whole point was that oh yeah if we do do this right if we make these new constructions for these new buildings there are ours of course with the new partnership alliance as well in new york city um it will result in there being more economic growth in the area because right you have new buildings, people like these new buildings, possibly you have more people moving into it. So you have this entire movement around this time, not just in Soho in the lofts, but around New York City that sort of basically feeds into the entire notion of the, of the Soho effect. And it is important to say that this was all controlled by a group of financial, you know, officials in the external financial sector that was created by David Rockefeller. So yeah, I mean, you can you can just imagine, right, where this goes. I mean, Rockefeller, like the entire name itself, right? You know, I know there's like a lot of influencers out here, but like, I wonder if anybody's like looking at me, just talking to myself and doing this thing, and they're like, man, that man is deranged. <laughs> I don't know. And this all comes to the global exploitation of solar lofts, which was a question that I didn't want to answer. And it's actually interesting because as someone who did not know this initially, it's kind of like, well, how does Soho or how does, how does Manhattan in that sense, because Soho is a part of Manhattan, get exported? Like, how does that even happen? Like, where is this happening if it is? And one place that I thought was really interesting that it was happening was England or London. I have my laptop right in front of me and it's, it, these, these places look really nice. I mean, especially the eight Harvard Square Lofts, they're opening in the downtown district. I think these are the perfect examples. I mean, these lofts, you know, are very aesthetically pleasing. They seem very trendy, pretty popular with uh, a lot of the London residents and the real estate developers completely took advantage of the entire idea. The imagery of just like, right, living in New York City, but not really going all the way to New York City, bringing New York City to London. The fact that these are called after Manhattan or rather taking inspiration from Manhattan itself you know it's like almost like the real estate developers in London were like you know we need we do need some of that and we have the money to do that so we're gonna do that people are gonna like it and I mean hey there's like three different websites that I just checked and they all have different types of lofts I mean one of them is like Manhattan lofts literally and some of them in the description on the side they literally have like, oh, wouldn't you like a little taste of NYC, the Soho living madness. To actually read off one of the captions here, bear with me. One of the most exciting districts of the city, Soho Lofts Apartments, allow you to explore the leisure and business opportunities of the area by the day and return to a welcoming and peaceful oasis in the evening. Nice. Characterized by their spacious and trending layout, these beautifully appointed one-bedroom apartments are designed with large windows, modern furniture, luxurious appliances, and tastefully decor. Tasteful. I think they said tasteful. Ah, it's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, I guess. It doesn't really matter if you have, like, typos on your main website when, like, you're making, like millions a year but i'm not gonna lie these places look really sweet i mean i thought it was also an, an isolated case study where it's like sure okay you have maybe these lofts apartments sort of creating maybe somewhere in the city where it's like right in like the downtown district like the more wealthy districts. okay we get it you know rich people get that it's fine 
but it is not just isolated to a certain class of people in the city of London. And I thought that was really interesting, especially looking at this mega plan that the city has, that in order for it to proceed forward, it needed like around $2 million to sort of like move forward with the entire plan. And now it's costing them about, I believe, $30 million in total for the entire... $300 million. $300 million. $300 million. That, that, that's, yeah, no, $30 million sounds like a little bit too, too low. London itself has been thinking of implementing actually more Soho-style apartments, lofts. That's what it's kind of called. It. It's like both, they're, they're using both words. It's kind of confusing, but like, let's just roll with it. They are thinking of using these to be implemented throughout like the city and more like towards the outskirts of London. They think it's very popular. And it's very interesting that this mega plan that, they're, that they are calling it, it's a huge plan, $300 million worth, of course, is being put in an abandoned hospital, which used to be called the London General Hospital, and basically have these new developments being put in this area. And what's more interesting is that they're actually calling it like affordable housing. And they're thinking of actually using uh, certain types of funds in order to, you know, help people of certain incomes. I mean, some of the lofts, as much as there is no set value of rent for these lofts that are about to be built, one of them, because there are different types of buildings, one of them is set to be priced around $500 to $700 of rent. So, I mean, for one bedroom, I guess that's pretty affordable. But this doesn't come with certain criticisms from the community as people believe that, well, the drug problem around London and people, you know, obviously abusing drugs or the homeless population is a much greater problem right now for them because it's, you know, unemployment sort of rising, uh, inflation, I mean, worldwide is pretty terrible right now. So I can kind of see like why the government did these, you know, uh, decide to do uh, this project and make these buildings. However, I mean, the people do also have a point. I mean, there's a high rate of just crime and robbery right now happening. And the city's like, oh yeah, no, we're, we're not gonna take initiatives towards that. We're gonna take initiatives towards this. However, my critique of this is that you basically have like London creating these apartments, obviously in inspiration of Soho, which is pretty cool because it's sort of like right exporting the idea of Manhattan, the certain types of architecture, uh, you know, even though it might not look completely the same, because we don't know, we don't know right now how it will look at the end, but it's just the idea of like, oh yeah, having New York City in London, isn't that so cool? But obviously, as we all know, even if they do start off at a 500, 700 bracket of rent, that could rise, or the price of rent could eventually, if it does rise in these lofts, it can also hurt the neighborhoods around it. And many people were actually worried about that as well. They share the same criticism as me because it always starts like that because rent isn't stagnant. You know, unless there's like heavy policy or regulation around it, which I'm not, from reading this article, I'm not seeing anything of. It's kind of like the rent can fluctuate because the housing market fluctuates, of course, because, you know, the economy fluctuates every single time. And there's like, there's only one ounce of optimism I have is that like various nonprofit organizations sort of signed off on like the deal and sort of the entire completion of this plan because it was their idea. Um, many organizations in London have sort of seen how renting has you know, already um, risen up or property prices are just, I mean, they're completely different from the 90s. I mean, people are now living more with their parents. You know, they're waiting longer until they get married um, and it is a struggle out here. So that part of me is still a little skeptical from the energy of it. I mean. I think what this shows is that there is a romanticization of New York styled Soho lofts, but in exporting the Soho loft, I think a lot of citizens um, in England, a lot of residents of London are sort of worried that not just, you know, the exportation of Manhattan might come, but the exportation of the Soho effect, where essentially, eventually, right, it might start off all, uh, colorful rainbows and butterflies, but it could initially be the first nail in sort of making a neighborhood with important social connections, networks that really benefit a community a 
all of a sudden being destroyed. I mean, it's really just interesting to sort of think about, right? You know, in, in exporting a quality from a certain place, you're exporting another quality that is undesirable. And this really then begs the question, you know, can you take something from an area, export it, and will it be successful in another one? I mean, obviously the answer to that is no, it might not be successful. But in this case, it's almost like people are really trying to, and I mean, you just have the clear example of what, ha what, what happens in Manhattan. There's a reason why we sort of see what happened in Manhattan and it's kind of like, yeah, well, you know, Manhattan's obviously expensive. Queens, a little bit less. Brooklyn, depending on which part of Brooklyn, I guess not Queens too, with Long Island City. But we all just know New York City is expensive now. I mean, yeah, we just, it's, it's just something that is known. And it's almost like gentrification that travels with the smell of New York City, I want to say. But no one really appreciates that smell. Some people might be like, wow, it's very alluring. And other people are like... You know, I can, I, can, I, can, I can even taste it, and it's not a good aftertaste. But the place I really do want to get to, which I thought threw me for a whole curveball because I didn't expect to actually come across this, was in China. I really wonder which POV is like better. Oh my gosh. I'm like bags under my bags. I love like how like you can hear the sounds of like what's happening outside <laughs> as like it's happening because because you know, for context of what's happening in China, there's a whole cultural shift similar to the one in the US where like in many Western countries, you do have younger adults waiting longer to get married, uh, settle down, and many of them are actually not really too with the notion of getting a home or sort of you know, buying uh, property themselves, but rather living, renting out until maybe later in their 30s. I personally think it's so cool, actually, like the entire cultural shift, number one, obviously, but in China, what is different is that it's a California tech firm. Yeah, California tech firm, if I am not mistaken. And so one, it is this firm that is established in California that is being funded, basically sponsored by the Chinese Merchant Bank. They've been giving out, you know, millions of dollars for this project. And of course, unlike the artists that inhabited uh, the Soho lofts, you have these very tech savvy, internet savvy individuals, you know, that are entrepreneurs, they're going to these creative fields, being of higher income, and they're going into these lofts. And China is very like transparent about it, where it's like, no, 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 no. We're not like London in a sense, we're like, oh yeah, we're gonna do like, make it affordable. No, like we know who's gonna be able to afford this. We know. And like, it's in a city in Shenyang, and it's interesting because not the entire city is very like high income. There are parts of it that are actually lower income, middle class. And what's alarming to some residents is that, again, will this result in uh, my house? Now all of a sudden, either like being like higher price, like will I have to pay more rent, I guess, for like my home? Uh, will I have to move out? Uh, where will this be? Because the project is being established near the city center, but they're looking to also make it in the peripheries and other neighborhoods. So it's really scary in that sense. The news isn't surprising though, as China is modernizing, like it's been modernizing for like the 21st century really quick. Other cities like Shanghai, for example. But the one in this case is that they particularly use the word Soho apartments as a little nod to Manhattan in that sense. And so they realize that in China, there is sort of a Western appreciation, even though they have a certain type of government that's very different from the United States, that isn't completely capitalist. There is an appreciation nonetheless for Soho lofts in New York City. And there's actually a very interesting quote by one of the, the designers. He has never been to Manhattan. However, he's been to London. And in London, guess what? They've actually implemented Soho or Manhattan style lofts that were inspiration from Soho, right, the, the entire neighborhood. So he's like, yeah, well, why not? It's like, you know, it's close enough, like, you know, we'll just implement it here. You know, I've seen the London apartments look pretty nice. We'll just do it here, obviously, with little tweaks, right, because um, we know what, you know, Chinese, young Chinese professionals love, and we'll make a little, a little bit of tweaks to, like, the aesthetic design of it, like, how it kind of looks. But come on, like, everybody knows, like, Soho apartments. It's been, like, in the mass media, they've been you know, very well publicized, they've been well researched. You have the idea of so, the idea of Manhattan being 
explored throughout. And I guess in China, they don't really care about exploring the social effect. I mean, right? They realize that, yeah, you know, people with high incomes. Look at this. Look at this, just thinking, going out here and thinking of other places, other global cities like England and China. Oh, jokes aside, that's a serious issue. I think not having those solutions is okay, but I think asking these questions of like, how much can populations be dislocated until it's like, probably like super not okay. <laughs> I say that as a euphemism. Um, but yeah, I mean like, so what point uh, can this occur and what will other global cities do? What will New York City do specifically? Uh, will a neighborhood other than Soho here like Jackson Heights or other places in Brooklyn, uh, the Bronx, will they become uninhabitable for current residents as maybe other regions of the US or other regions of the world continue to modernize and implement possibly these Soho lofts because they're so aesthetically pleasing, they're so trendy and everybody wants to be in them. So it's something to really consider. And with that, I guess as a final remark or closing question for this, other than the questions I just asked would be, well, who has the right to the city? Which is a question that's not new, but is very important to, I guess, state in this context. Just keep you guys thinking, keep everybody thinking on what could be for the future.